Hi, I'm Joe Johnson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, He was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as He does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the Word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what He said, how to cooperate with His kingdom, so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with Him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, it's a good thing to come into the house of God. Right now, the numbers are showing there's a lot of folks that aren't even showing up in church. Christianity, by the way, Christi Jesus doesn't go on the decline, just polls and their nomenclatures do. But one of the things that's happening, and listen, I don't blame, you know, there's some folks that, you know, with going into the house of God and so on. You know, there's a serious problem when the master's ambassadors are fighting over whether they even want to ta talk about his constitution. If you've got the pulpit being filled with people wanting to change the rules midstream, we got some problems. And so why would someone want to follow? Because, see, here's the thing. Right now, the world sees Jesus through his church. That's the way it's supposed to be. We're the fullness of him that fills all in all. And just as when Jesus said this, he says, you know, and Philip says, well, you know, if you just show us the Father, that'll be enough. He's like, Philip, McFly, don't you know if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? What is the world seeing when they see the body of Christ? Right now, a lot of, some of what they're seeing, if not a lot, is a bunch of confused folks where now we're even fighting over whether we want to believe all of the Word of God or not. That's a problem. That's a, see, that's a problem when our concern is more whether something might be potentially offensive versus t telling the truth. Because here's what happens. You know what that means? That means the audience is dictating to the Word of God what it's going to say, not the Spirit of God dictating, say this. And see, if we don't have confidence in our King and His ability to demonstrate His goodness, if we don't have confidence, why should someone else have confidence? Now, you might ask, Pastor, what about our series? I'll get to that, but I'll, this morning, as it, it, I, I'm pretty sure <laughs> we'll get to keep going on our series but uh this morning as i was praying seeking heaven and just doing my thing i had a, a heaviness in my heart as i was praying in the spirit not doom and gloom heaviness a heaviness that comes from me and uh, uh some of you i would hope most of you know what this is not a heaviness doom and gloom but heaviness you haven't prayed it all out yet like in other words you, you don't have yet everything i want to say and, this more, and then when I finally got it, I was like, all right, good, I had my V8, let's go to church now. And there's some things that we're going to talk about. We're going to keep talking about faith, and we're going to talk about the Word of God, but we're going to integrate some things because uh, there are, you know, the enemy doesn't take, Satan doesn't take a break. And see, he does things the same way that God does things. He sent, puts out ideas and strongholds. You either have bad strongholds or you have good strongholds. But your brain, everybody's brains works the same. And here's the thing, whether your inner man is saved or not, in other words, uh, uh, when we came to Christ, we were born again. All things became new. We became sons of God. We have God's DNA now. Well, that DNA is locked in a body as long as you are alive. And the way it gets out is this gets changed so that the life of God can come out. Well, the same thing works with the kingdom of darkness. The enemy needs bodies too. And what he does is he gets ideas out there, people believe those ideas, and then they act out those ideas. And here's the thing, until Jesus comes back, every generation is going to go through this. Like the human race, we get harvested every 80, 90 years, however long you're going to live. We just keep being harvested, and we, call that, we can call that harvest a generation. And so generations come and generations go. Here's the thing, until Jesus comes back, Satan doesn't come and go. Devils don't come and go. They're the same. They recognize that every generation is meant to be a harvest field for God. 
Every generation is meant, it's always white for the harvest. We don't wait for white harvest. It's always going to be white for the harvest because that's the very reason humans are alive, created in his image. It's given back to them once they come into Christ. And every generation is going to go through this. And here's the thing. Once we come to Christ and we develop our relationship with him, well, guess what? You get a sickle in your hand and you got a job to do and you get to go out and be a blessing to your generation as well. And the primary way, listen, the pri- you don't have to look for some being with horns and some warped out exorcist kind of thing. You find the enemy in the ideas that he had. Now, it's, there's a personality behind it. But you find where he is in every region by the ideas that they're believing. Well, I wonder what the principality of the stronghold over the area is. Well, what are the, what are the fundamental lies that people are believing? And see, the Word of God has been given. Listen, we tear down strongholds, thoughts, imaginations, high things that exalt themselves, that try to come against the knowledge of God. Listen, we're called on not just individually, but in our generation to minister these things back to about three minutes ago. Listen, we got problems when academia and all, even some of the greatest names can't even go on a public television station or The View or Bill Maher, Maher, and tell the truth about what the Word of God says. And here's the thing about biblical, biblical faith. Listen, if we're trying to raise a church that survives on her emotions, we're in major trouble because the Word of God has given us to anchor when our emotions don't line up. And I don't know if I'm the only person in this planet that's ever had emotions that really work very hard not to align with the Word of God. Am I the only one? And so I, <laughs> I thank God. And, you know, when I used to fly uh, flight management systems, when you're at 40,000 feet out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you're really glad that you've got all of your computers working just fine and all your instruments are working great because day or night you don't see nothing when you're out in the middle of nowhere. But everything's fine, and it doesn't matter what you feel like because, man, you got everything's just working. This has been programmed right The information in the computer is accurate. That information feeds the displays. The displays tell me everything's going on. Well, the Word of God does the same thing in your life. The Word of God will do the same thing in your life and every generation. You feed your soul, the inform- your spirit, the information through your soul. It will bring back the information. Listen, there were times... I'm thinking one of the last times I was uh, the previous company I was flying for. We were and it was very warm. Now it's gonna, you're gonna it's gonna sound crazy when I say it was like extremely warm at 40,000 feet, but it was extremely f- warm at negative 42 degrees Celsius. Standard temperature should be minus 56. Well, what happens is when it gets that warm. It's hard, for the, it's hard for the airplane to be able to perform. The engines aren't working uh, as good as they could. The, uh, warmer air is thinner. And so I'm thinking of a time, when it actually happened a number of times, where I was out over the middle of the ocean driving this thing and happened to navigate through thunderstorms. And here's the thing. When you're out over in the middle you're, uh, uh, of the ocean, the Atlantic, you, you're, you can't directly talk to people like you are over the land. They have HF radio, and it takes a lot of, and you're really locked in. You've got to drive. You've got to stay here and so on. Long story short, I could hardly keep the, and it wasn't dangerous, was it? but I could hardly keep the altitude. I had storms going all around me. I had passengers in the back. And there was a lot of stuff going around me. But everything was totally fine. And you know why? Because the vehicle was right, my information was right, I could judge and I could steer and go through whether, no matter what the weather was doing, no matter what the kids and the, the grandkids in the back were doing. Why? Because this had been prepared, my information was accurate, and I was able and could continually, and it's happening right like today, there's jets all over the world right now doing the same thing. Because this was right, Everything turned out just right. My friends, right now, there is crazy, crazy attacks, even throughout now our culture more than ever, uh, attacks against Christianity, certainly the Word of God. And uh, I quote this um, uh, Barnapol regularly, uh, about 50% of Christians don't even believe the whole Word of God should be the compass. They'll call themselves Christians, but yet half 
won't even use the word of God as their compass. That has put us in a very dangerous situation. It puts your personal life in a situation. Because here's the thing, and we've talked about this before. When Jesus, when, when, when he was tempted in the wilderness, he responded, it is written, because he could trust wholeheartedly in the word of God. I have a question for you. How can you quote, it is written, when you're questioning half of it? And some of the reasons, most of the reason why half of you are questioning is because you haven't even done, you, and I'm a you third person plural, not this church. You guys are like geniuses. I'm, I'm of course, talking to other people. I'm, of course, talking to, you know, those people out there, not here. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> and a lot of our theology is being developed over tequila shots at the bar but the person doesn't have a clue any more than you do, or watching TV, or if I don't get in and out of church in 20 minutes, I'm going to find somebody else that makes me happy. And I'll say this, and I th I'll get to the lesson, but I'm going to finish up because there's some other stuff I want to bring around. While you're getting mad at me because I'll go 50 minutes as, instead of 20, and while people are looking for churches that want to keep things simple all the time, our enemy is filling universities and senate seats with people that aren't looking for 20-minute lessons. And ideas are coming at you from the left, from the right. The average, right now, the average, we talked about this a few weeks ago, it's fact. The average millennial right now is on their multimedia device for six and a half hours a day. And if you don't think for one second you're not being preached something, your, your head is so far in the sand. <laughs> Where did you think I was going to go with that? <laughs> and so that's a good advertisement for the series that we're on. When it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to faith, and understanding how this kingdom works. But we'll start with this. Listen, if it, was, if it is written was what Jesus stood on, then we need to determine once and, while it is written, and once and for all, it is written is what we'll stand on. And you won't survive with that because, see, part of their argument in the world today is to try to make this thing like it's another religion of the earth. Christianity, whatever you want to call it, has nothing to do with the earth. It doesn't originate here. It originates with our Father, who loves us so much, He sent the second person of Godhead in human form, who He called the Son of God. He originated, remember, He, come, he, pour, he proceeds forth out of the bosom of the heart of the Father. He emanates out of the Father like light emanates from the Son. And that life that allows them to do that very thing is the third person of the Godhead, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. There's nothing earthly about this. And as long as, and here's the thing, we keep getting, we, we, we keep running into difficulty because we, we keep trying to keep this thing of the earth. We're on the earth, but we're not of it. So if I can encourage you as we're going into the Word of God to recognize, listen, we're talking about, and we've been given the privilege to enjoy heavenly things and bring them here. Boy, I daydream regularly about meeting Oprah. <laughs> Bill Maher. The View. You think Jesus would be intimidated? So why are the sons of God? Listen, and we've talked about this before. If you're going to get invited on one of those shows, can you please not look like you're a squirming little child? You already know what they're going to ask you when you go on that show. If you're not going to tell the truth, then don't even go on it. Because we look ridiculous. Are we interested in going into the Word of God? I thought we might. All right, so what we're going to do is, you know, I just... I love this job. <laughs> chapter 2. We're going to call this in our faith manual, Chapter 2. Let's grow up. Let's grow up. 
Let's grow up learning how to walk with God, enjoy his kingdom. And what I want to do today is, and again, as I, I had to rearrange some stuff as, as I prayed things out, and I knew there were some things, and I'll, I'll talk about it here in a little bit as we finish up. I have three goals for today. First, we're going to review what we've been talking about. Remember I said last week uh, the Holy Spirit was very clear. It wasn't emergency break, stop, but put the brakes on. Do not be in a hurry talking about these principles. Don't be in a hurry. Just slow. Tortoise wins the race. Tortoise wins the race. People say, wow, you know, I, I, I've heard that message before. Well, that's, that'd be like uh, putting a steak on my grill and going, wait a minute, I don't want that steak. Well, why not? Well, because I've had a steak before. (laughs) Look, if something's really good, you want to eat it over and over and over, right? So I would suggest whenever something starts going off, well, I've already heard this again before, that's a problem. I've actually found, like, if I ever get tempted, and, you know, I've been at this a long time now, but I remember, you know, I've learned, and I remember the time it really hit me, is the day I start going, ah, you know, I've already heard this, I'm in great danger, and I better pay the most attention, because it's probably the very thing I need to hear. It might be that little last piece of the jigsaw puzzle that makes the whole thing pop, right? Okay, so we're going to review. We're going to add a few more ingredients today, and I am purposely are going to leave us hanging, because I want you back. And, well, not only that, but where I, where I thought this week, where I wanted to go, I wanted to start getting into uh, parable of the sower and different things. There was just no way I was going to be able to develop those thoughts. So I definitely want to get us pumped and get ready for it. So three things we're going to do. We're going to review, uh, add a few more ingredients, and leave you hanging. So first thing, Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it is impossible. Say impossible. To please him, forever would draw, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So we've spent a lot of time the past two weeks talking about, first of all, if it's impossible to please God without faith, we better get faith. Right? we got to get faith. So, and this is important because and, and, and when we were worshiping and we were talking about being lavished and with the love of God, there's a lot of folks that hear the word of God, but they don't, don't enjoy the benefits of it because they don't believe it. Like Pastor Greg earlier, when he was taking up the offering, you know, how many times, if you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard the, you know, pour out a blessing can't contain, out of the bosom people give. If you do an inventory of your life, are you overabundant? You don't have to answer yes or no. Are you? So we have to ask ourselves, how many, how many years even are we going to go through and hear verses and not experience them? We're finding out a reason why we don't experience them. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. See, he doesn't promise something and not expect to be able to follow through and do it for you. He just, there's a formula to it. There's a, like, it's tang, you better add your water. And notice what we're supposed to believe. Forever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, but that also he's a rewarder of those who seek him. And we've spent, we've spent a bunch of time really getting in our heads because you'll hear people out there, well, I believe God, I believe in God. Well, that's not the whole thing. To approach God, if you want to turn God on, if you're going to get into his face and talk to him about some things, the things that he wants to hear, okay, you, if you showed up, you believe, if you've shown up, you believe he's there. Devils believe he's there. He's fully expecting you to go. Good things are going to result from being with him. Let's keep going. And we said this, praying without faith is like trying to fly without wings. I found this, what a perfect illustration. And the elephants trying to fly. Isn't that awesome? I laughed my head off this morning when I found that. Praying without faith is like trying to fly without wings. And last week especially, we spent a bunch of time going, look, it's important that we determine that when we go into the presence of God, and I'm talking about petitional, hey, God, this is going on, I really need help. I'm not talking about relational things. You you should be talking to God all the time. He's your Father in the name of His Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is talking about, Lord, I got this thing going on, and your word says this. We need to see this. Let's go. And so when we approach him, praying without faith, and so, and I challenged all of us last week, how many of us have gone before God praying, but 
having absolutely no conviction of his willingness to bless and answer that prayer. There's a lot of crying and whining tossed up to God, but he says it's impossible to please him without a confidence that he wants to reward you, wants to bless you. And so we talked about, the next thing we've talked about is how important it is that we understand our identity. There's a lot of talk today in culture, I identify as. Well, here's what we need to identify as. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And then we quoted this earlier uh, today. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Beloved, we are God's children. And notice the emphasis. You go to the Greek, guess what? Now means now. We are God's children now. And last week I used the illustration. Listen, and, and we talked about in John 15, it says, you know, no longer do I call you servants, but now I'm calling you friends. And I came up because it rhymed. I said, when you approach God, do you, is your attitude besties? or beggar? Are you God's friend? Do you understand when you, when you approach him in the name of Jesus that he has lavished you with his incredible love, or are you crawling and begging and pleading? See, it's, it's huge what our identity, what we understand, what happened to us. And of course, we spent a lot of time on <coughs> fear not, little flock, it is your father's good pleasure. And remember that word pleasure literally means delight. We can put it this way. When, you, when, I, when I go before the father and I come boldly before the throne of grace, I can literally translate that when I come before him confident that I have his audience and that he's going to reward me, God's going, yippee! That's what it means, delight, take pleasure. Yes, come on in here, boy, let's talk. So when was the last time you approached God like that? See, religion has taken a stick to your head and it's beating the daylights out of you so much, it's taking your confidence away. And you think that's God to go in there before no confidence because you know you don't want to be proud. Listen, confidence isn't pride. Confidence is being smart and trusting God at his word. If he says this is who I am, then I'm going to trust him. By the way, if I can't trust him to know he's lavished me and calls me his son, how can I trust him to meet all my needs according to riches and glory? How can I trust him with all the other promises in the word of God? So it's huge. It's huge that the Father is going yippee when you walk into his presence. Get on in here. So we spent a lot of time talking about that. <clears throat> therefore, and then Jesus when he was talking about faith, therefore I tell you whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Now, faith is being sure is the evidence of the reality of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. In God's eyes, faith is ownership. Faith is now. It's ownership. Jesus said, look, whatever things you ask for in prayer, believe you've received them, and you shall have them. If it's impossible to please God without faith, we're learning what faith is. Faith is the ability, and by the way, you can get better at it every day. And we're going to look at that here in a minute. Faith is the developed ability to know when you've presented something to the Father. You approached Him confident. You approached Him knowing what the Word of God says about your situation. And it's leaving the living room knowing the Father has said, it's done. It's done. So the question is, how many prayers through the years have you not done that? And see, that's an important question. See, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help me. And what these things, <clears throat> what these principles do is they, they, they get right in the face of, remember I was talking about how the devil works? He just, he just tells lies and people believe him. It gets right in the face of since from the beginning in the Garden of Eden, did God really say? Constantly causing you, see, listen to the thing, that when, whether Adam and Eve are doing it or you are doing it. When we question and go, well, I don't know about this. Well, God didn't really mean, well, you know, he doesn't 
bless all. He doesn't heal all. We go with these things, and you know what you're doing? You're saying to God, you know what? I, it, there it is written, but you know what? I just don't think you're going to pony up. You know, so you can say that. Well, and here's what's caused all this bad doctrine that's out there. What happens is, oh, do you remember? Here's an illustration. How do you like my shirt? I nailed it. Those are not nails. They're T's. They're T's. Say T, okay, as in golf. Bill, I can see if I can find you one, too. Get us ready for that tournament, right, brother? Oh, thought you might be. Okay, they're golf tees. It's that time of the year, right? Well, I remember when my Robin was playing, learning how to play golf, and it just, well, any of us. You know, there's just, and see, that's what's cool about the game of golf is because it's really not easy to do. I mean, like, when you really, when you stripe one, it's like, yeah, I really achieved something. Greg, you might be able to do that one day. Uh, anyway. <laughs> By the way, I think we're playing tomorrow. I don't know what you're doing. And she, Robin, was starting getting, you know, upset, and I, and I said to her, I was like, you're not good enough to be upset. No, she wasn't. In other words, she's just picking up the game. Why are you getting mad at something you're just picking up? You're not good at Now, me, if I'm going to bend my club around a tree, bless God, I have every right and I deserve it because I know how to play the game. And then, of course, then Christmas comes around and I get a new set. Where I'm going with that. When people, where I'm going with that is when people say that they want to take up golf. If you're going to take up golf, go get lessons. And the reason why you want to get lessons is because what happens is you've got some of the most ridiculous types of swings that are out there. All sort for everything from Neanderthal, blah, all right, to, no, I'm not going to pick on you anymore. Let's just say this, because I have to live with my wife, so I won't pick on her anymore. If you're not taught right, and if anybody's ever played golf, especially with someone that has no clue what they're doing, not only do they look ridiculous, they can't hit that ball for nothing. So now here's my question. Let's say you go, you go to play golf and you don't have lessons. What would happen is after you tried to play your 18 holes, you walked away and you went, you know what, God just doesn't like good golfers. It's not his will for me to play right. People do that with the Word of God all the time. They have bad form. They don't know what they're doing. They swing, they miss, they lose five golf balls, or they get things they don't see. They don't get their answers. They don't see success in the kingdom. And what they do is they, don't, they don't, wouldn't consider for a second that it's their bad form. It must be God's fault. And see, that, that's a problem. That's a problem when a bunch of his creation is, and you know, most of us try to be holy about it, I said, well, you know, God can answer no sometimes. Don't. Well, you know why? Yeah, that's a great out. And the only reason why you actually would have that out is because you must not know the verse in 1 John chapter 5 says that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. You have the word to tell him what, he want, what, what, what you're allowed to ask, and you also have in your heart. When I go before him, I already know what I'm supposed to ask him. And if I don't, I say, I don't really know how to deal with this. Oh, there's another verse for that one. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. So I'm covered when it comes to the specific petition, or if I don't, I'm covered because I get to ask for wisdom. Either way, I can fully expect to get my answer i'm not supposed to go before him and go well i guess the answer is no why would i go before him if i hadn't already worked out that the answer is supposed to be yes we're not supposed to have guesswork this is our father that is elevated to a place to where we're seated together with him in a heavenly places with christ jesus And the sons of God are on the earth to demonstrate the goodness of God. Not be confused and wondering whether dad up above has even left us as orphans. <clears throat> it's a good thing you're in church today. Because you know what? You're learning form. When you come into the house of God and you learn, 
and we break open the Word of God, you're learning where to put your feet. If you need to hit a draw, you move your feet back. Close it up. If you need to hit a fade, open it up. You learn how to no, <laughs> You don't swing like this. That's a hammer and a nail. Okay? You bring it back. Well, it's the same thing with the Word of God. And if it's, it's kind of like if school is an option growing up, you severely handicapped your ability to lead a successful life in this earth. If the house of God is an option, you severely handicap your ability to enjoy the goodness of your God in this life. Okay? So faith is ownership. Let's keep going. You all with me so far? All right. So if it's with that, impossible to please God without faith, where do I find it? Where do I go? Because I, you'll hear people say, well, I just don't have any faith. Here's a good one. Well, I've lost my faith. Wait until next week. <laughs> Are we gonna, I, I, oh, but, and some of you might be going, well, it's Memorial Day. We should tell Jesus that right now, by the way. You know, Jesus, we only want half the Holy Spirit next week because you understand it's Memorial Day. I made my point. No, I'm setting this up to start talking about how it is that we discover, we learn, we grow. And if you're in the position, there's a lot of folks are either, oh, I don't have any faith, I lost my faith. It is impossible to lose faith. It's impossible. I'm going to prove it to you. It is absolutely impossible to lose faith. What is possible for you to focus your faith on the wrong thing? But see, the human being always has faith. You're always believing something. So the idea that I've just lost my faith, no, what you've decided to do is refocus what you believe on something that's not accurate. And you believe that. The statement that says, well, I've lost my faith is a statement of faith. It's a statement of what you believe. So let's find out where it is that we find faith and why did I answer that? Think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has signed. How many people are supposed to think with sober judgment? Each one. Why? Because every one of us have been distributed a measure or the measure of faith. Faith is an element of your nature as much as biceps are an element of your body. You can't not have you have it. You have it. We're all believing something right now. You believe something about your marriage. You believe something about your health. You believe something about the government. You're believing something about me right now. I trust it's good. <laughs> and if it's not, you and God deal with it. <laughs> he loves me. Okay, there's a couple. God loves me. And you know, I have great favor. And his promises are yes and amen. Did you know it says that? Oh, there's another little addendum, I would, little ditty I want to throw out there. No, this is good. It hasn't even begun to get weighty yet. But I know, again, we're talking to people in other churches. So you on TV, you listen up, because it's not anybody in here. So you listen. We're praying for you. Okay, you guys, let, let's really believe God because these poor people out there are going through things you never would go through. The Apostle Paul, whether he had stripes on his back, thrown in prison, shipwrecked, you couldn't, not only could you not kill the guy, but he said, you know, all the promises of God, all of them, are yes and amen, not maybe and no according to some theology, not yours, theirs. I want to just ask you, and again, you're not in here, but how many times have you seen, and I'm going to submit. See, the Apostle Paul continually, the devil was doing everything he could to stop him. All the man wanted to do was talk about God. He's in the middle of a dungeon, and he's talking about being in a seat in a heavenly place with Christ Jesus. My point, where I'm going with this is this. How many of you all in your living room, let alone in church, how much percentage of your time, again, those people, but you've seen it. Well, the devil's just beating me up real bad. I'm not going to make it. My family's getting beat up. 
I'm sick. I'm never going to get healed. My finances, man, the devil's just, oh, do you see how bad our country is? Oh, we're never going to make it. And what we do is out, I've got to stop saying we, because I know it would never happen here. But ask yourself how much you've heard the devil get even more testimony than the Word of God. Ask yourself how much talk, all right, and now I won't be sarcastic. Pastor, man, I just want to tell you things are great. Things are awesome. It doesn't matter that you got one day to live, you got no food in your house, you have a promise of God. Oh, pastor, things are great. Things are awesome. I can't wait. Man, you're going to preach like you've never preached before. Instead of, Pastor, can I just talk to you because it's just, I'm going to die. I'm not going to make it. Well, how do you know you're not going to make it? Because I looked up WebMD and it told me what I've got. (laughs) And out of our mouths, here's the Apostle Paul in the middle of the prison. He says, all right, leave me alone. I bear my body the stripes of the Lord Jesus, but he spent the rest of the six chapters talking about how amazing God is. In in Galatians, where that's from, he was talking about how the law was passed away now and we have grace through faith. How many of us, the first response out of our mouth is what the devil's doing in our life, not what the Word of God says? You wonder why it's hard to believe? Because you're renewing your mind more to what's bad in your life, not what the Spirit of God has said and the promises that he's made to you. And how much is that... Tested as the enemy's testimony coming to church. How much? You know, there's been there. You know, there's been times where, a couple times I've had I'll go back into my office, and just get my head clear because you come in and, and it doesn't mean that things aren't ha- happening in your life and stuff. But you got to ask yourself how much is your brain and how much is coming out of your mouth of what the devil's doing instead of what God's doing bringing it back around you have faith you have faith you have it he's distributed it to you just like a a normally built human being i'm not talking about things that can happen as a result of the fall or accidents but a normally designed human being has biceps has triceps has stomach muscles some are well more hidden than others you have faith You have faith. That you have lost your faith is a lie. What you've decided to do is put it somewhere else. Now, see, that's actually good news for you. See, that's good news that you haven't lost your faith because if you haven't lost it and you still have it, now all you have to do is just steer the wheel in a different direction. See, that's a whole lot easier and and makes it a lot simpler than thinking, I've got to go try to find something. He has distributed to every human being the measure of faith appropriate to what it is he's called you to do okay let's keep going so the question at hand is not do i have faith the question is how do i properly develop my faith how do i properly develop my arm so instead of 12 ounce curls i can have five pound curls and 10 pound curls and how do i develop and I want to show something. something. This is where I'm going to leave us hanging. And I got just uh, something I want to uh, leave you with that was, like I said, I prayed out in the spirit. It's like, I want you to share this. Let's read this verse. Watch this. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Say growing. growing. Say Increasing. I have a question for you. Do you think there is a major difference between this person and that person? Should there be a major difference between that person and the other person? All right, well, you just got yourself set up. If you don't know Christ, and you're still, you just, you're you're not saved, you don't know the Lord and stuff like that, that's cool. I'll talk to you like you're there. But if you're there, why do you still demand that the information stay at that level? Why would you demand, I just, get me in and out. Get me in and out. I just want to, come on. 
our faith, and now remember, we found out what faith is. Faith is the ability. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen, meaning we are, we are supposed to be growing in our ability to be able to approach the Father and see more and more accomplished on the earth because we know we've got it even before we see it. Yesterday, today, it might be a hamburger. It might be some food in the cupboard. Tomorrow, my gosh, it ought to be your block. It ought to be the department in your work. It ought to be your family. It ought to be instead of having your needs met, having so much come in that you're able to give to every good work on top. We're supposed to be growing in our ability to believe God and to see the kingdom of heaven. Question, question, because these guys are all adults, so I know it's you guys out there that got a problem. How many of you are in the exact same position with God as you were five years ago? How many are still dealing with the things that you've had in your life for five years and ten years? Why are we here, even though we're built like this, why are we there? Because there's only one reason why. There's only one reason. You're not working it. We're not learning. You've been taught church is about how to sit and be entertained and watch people swing from chandeliers instead of breaking open the Word of God and causing your mind and your spirit and your body to conform to the will of God and what He purchased for you at the cross. And this is what I said. I said this earlier. And this is big in our country nowadays. It's huge. Just get the people in and out. Pastor, keep it simple. One of the things that I appreciate about our team is we're working on, we recognize that we have to be able to meet people where they're at here. But your whole ministry can't be developed around that. And as we, and as we said earlier, listen, colleges, universities, political seats are being filled with people and their minds that are conformed to the kingdom of darkness it doesn't bother them to study year after year after year after year when was the last time you spent more than a half hour in the word of god And what I'm trying, I'm try, I am on purposely doing this because whether it's giving you faith or agitating, I, if I have to, I hope I just make you so mad at me that you're here next week just because you're so mad. <laughs> but that you want to learn because this, you guys, the sons of the most high. God, the scriptures, the Apostle Paul says at the end in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, at the end as a result of our new nature, he says, we have the mind of Christ. And you're telling me if I've got the mind of Christ, I've got to do everything I can to stand before the pulpit and give you finger painting? This generation is ours in Christ. It's ours. There isn't supposed to be any thought that runs up against the word of God that cannot be brought down and put underneath their feet. Where are those that are skilled? This, the apostle Paul stood before Caesar and he didn't need a political lobbyist. He just needed the anointing and God to know the man was smart enough to be able to stand before him and unapologetically Speak the word of God. He lost his head. Big deal. So what? So what? Peter as well. Caesar himself. Domitian. John, do you know how John, did we talk about this last week? And we're, we're starting to wind down. No, we're not over yet, but we're starting to wind down. That's another inside joke. Do you know how John ended up on the island of Patmos? Did we talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, they threw him in the oil to kill him. He wouldn't recant. John's like, this is my best, my best friend. He's my God. I can't deny him. All right, throw him in the oil. He comes out spitting bubbles with it. You know, this kid, my granddaughter's got one of those little things, and those little bubbles blow through the hole. He just comes out going, next. Scared the night, just scared the guy to death. He's, all right, we better get rid of him, something special. So they threw him on the island of Patmos. Okay. Where are the sons of God? We're the sons of God that can serve the PTA, serve on the school boards, 
serve in the local government? Where are the sons of God that can go in the workplace and not cry and be upset because their boss is a clown or is mean? Since when are mean people supposed to bother you anyway? Since when? People were meanies to Paul, and he just ended up writing Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Timothy. We didn't hear much about what the devil did, but we heard a whole lot about what God did. Will you please go with me to go from there to there? All right, this is what I want to do, and this is where we'll finish. And I mean this. This is where we're going to finish. <laughs> I have too much fun. More stewing. And this is what was on my heart this morning. Remember I said I just knew I hadn't, there was something else that he wanted to say, and it goes along with a lot of the theme today. So is your faith growing exceedingly? Is it? Next week, we're going to go into detail and break down the number one area Christians have failed in when it comes to success in the kingdom of heaven. That's where we're going to start next week. We're going to break down. If you have you got family members, husbands, don't go to church, the rear ends need to be in here. Wives, fathers, parents, anybody, co-workers, even people that don't know Christ, they're going to get a real good defense of how this stuff works. It's going to be huge. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. Okay? This is what I saw this week, and this is what came to my heart, and I just want to encourage this. Vice President Mike Pence was giving us... Uh, and this has everything to do with what I'm talking about. This is what he said at the commencement ceremony. Uh, it was at, I think it was at Liberty University. Some of the loudest voices for tolerance today have little tolerance for traditional Christian beliefs. So as you go about your daily life, just be ready. Because you are going to be asked not just to tolerate things that violate your faith. You're going to be asked to censor them. To bow down to the idols of popular culture. If you're arguing over whether the Word of God is still even the Word of God, you already bow down. Right now, as a result of the things that are going on, and remember I talked about this earlier, and I just really want to encourage you guys, when it comes to just going after God, seeking God, put the finger paint paper and paints away. You guys, listen, we'll meet the baby, but I got a question for you. How many of you all have read, you know, I wrote an uh, article about two weeks ago, and it, and it blessed a lot of people. It was out on politics, culture, LGBT, okay? And see, I write these things to help you. That article took me over 40 hours to write. Now, remember, my editors are like Kenneth Hagin, like, editor. I mean, it took me a long time. And I heard some really good things about it, but here's another, but here's, I'm wondering, in reference to this, how come I hear folks, folks go, oh, it was just too long, I didn't want to read it. Well, it's just too long. You guys were living in a real world, and it's after your brain. How have the sons of God not had the time, it'll take you 23 minutes to read it. And folks, I want to challenge you because I hear his heart. And I heard him say this when I was praying in the spirit this morning. And, and uh, I was praying in, uh, in my spiritual language and translated instantly to English. The spirit said to me, I need my people's voice. I need their voices. Because I speak through them. I speak through them. And I could have gone farther, but... We're closing now, 25 after. He needs our voices and in context, context with what we've been talking about today. Please, please, let's go after God. Please, let's have a heart and a soul to go into God. Let's, let's not take the easy way out anymore. Because, you know, I, I'm up to three grandchildren now. And did you know two of our politicians? Did you know one of the people, as a matter of fact, I, the fellow, uh, uh, 
uh, is his last name, and he's convinced that that um, that God has made him with um, as a homosexual. He can believe it all he wants, but does it stand up to scrutiny? And see, listen, the world should he shouldn't even hear what the Bible says. You ought to be able to critically reason and look at these different things. You're, we're too busy as Christians going, wow, the Bible says the Bible doesn't mean nothing to them. It's not an authority in their life, but we ought to be able to critically reason and walk through and go these things. So now not only, so this fellow is mad at Franklin Graham for saying, uh, sir, if you're a Christian, you just might want to be careful about your theology on this. But now he and uh, our junior socialist uh, senator, and I'm, notice how I'm not naming parties, I'm naming ideas. That's another thing you need to stay at. Stay out of parties, stick with ideologies. What's the idea? Because once you go down this road, now you start isolating people. It's the wrong argument. It's the idea that's the argument. But now both of them, <coughs> you ready for this? And see here, they have a microphone. By their position, because they don't finger paint, they have a position and their microphone, and, their, and they have just said within the past couple of weeks, they are equating Christianity with radical Islam. And they're getting away with it. And they have a microphone, because whether you agree with these things or not, and I, hopefully you don't equate Christianity with radical chopping heads off Muslims. They're out there and they have a microphone because they gave up finger painting. They fell in love with a cause. And here's the thing. You know what's the enemy? The idea is the enemy. It's not even the people. The idea is. like They, they believe that because that got there somehow. And I've got to ask myself where was somebody to say, you know what, we need to go out to dinner because this whole stuff is, you, you need to help explain this to me. And then be able to keep up and go back and forth. And I thank God for, if the homeschool, but listen, homeschool because God told you to, but don't homeschool because you want to get into a cave because you're so afraid of this dirty, bad little world. That didn't work for Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Shouldn't work for our kids either. And if you're going to train them in the home, train them to be conquerors, so when you boot them out, they go and make a difference for God. And so when we talk, we're going to talk about next week. I'm going to tell you where we're going to go. I'm seeing in the parable of the sower, which we're going to call next week, not the parable of the sower, the parable of the soil. The parable of the soil. We're going to find, did you know that there's one of those soils that Satan can come in and out all day long and do stuff to you and cause you to believe things that aren't true and then like the dandelion in your yard, unless you have someone come and treat it. You just go, poof. The little white things go all over the place and they just plant their ideas. Now to demonstrate, he was talking about so much more than, okay, put the seed in the ground. Oh my God, it's like I'd never read it before, the things that he's teaching me. You have my word. I'm giving you everything I have. I'm giving you my word that I have a team around me, not just in this church, but of ministers, all the way up to international status that sow into me and feed me. So when I come up and come out and I digest and I give something to you, it really can change not just your own success with God, but make you a difference in this generation. It's an honor. Come on. What an opportunity. What an opportunity. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for the Word of God. We thank you so much. We thank you for the amazing price that you've paid. I quoted earlier that we have, as a result of being born again, the mind of Christ. It means we have the slate, the chalkboard, that can have the laws of God written in our hearts now. And not just the words, but the, the understanding of them. And Father, as the pastor of this church, I commit Gosstown Harvest Christian Church to be a church that we're going to go after everything that you've made available. 
First, we're going to go after your love and presence. We're going to enjoy and experience your gifts, natural and supernatural gifts. We're going to enjoy being in the living room of God. But we're also going to be approach. No, that's not right. We're going to make ourselves available to you to make a difference in this generation before we cycle out of here. So, Father, I just pray a blessing over everybody here in this room. If you're here for the very first time, I, the lights are kind of hitting me. I was kind of lost in the message, too. I haven't really looked around. If you're here for first as a first-time guest, or even if you've been here for a while, and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, I want to invite you now just to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to make sure that you're right with God. Those of you watching by live stream, say, Pastor Joe, I know I'm not right with God, and I want to pray right now. The prayer is simple. It's as easy as breathing. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins, and I'll serve you forever. It was that simple. Hi, this is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His Word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you, serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you real soon.